Hey guys, I'm back! Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. It has been a long time since I've been able to cover a launch. This is one of my absolute favorite things to do. Uh, watching rockets launch is, is my favorite thing anyway, and then hanging out with you guys is my other favorite thing. So this is my two favorite things combined. Welcome to my coverage of the SpaceX launch. SpaceX is launching the Telstar 18 Vantage, or 18V, satellite for Telesat. Uh, now, I want to train you guys on something because I get a lot of the same questions over and over and over and over and over and over again. I'm going to teach you guys something. Have you ever heard of this website called everydayastronaut.com? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Well, check this out. If you go to my website, everydayastronaut.com, there's these things called pre-launch previews. And what I did for you guys is I go through every launch and we make sure that we tell you literally everything you need to know. Like, what time is this going to take off? Actually, this one... Uh, is no longer isn't currently updated, but it is updated on the main thing. Uh, I promise. Um, mission name, what it is? Who's the customer? Telesat. What rocket is it? This is a Falcon 9. It's a Block 5 version, and this is serial number B1049. And notice the point one means it's the first time this core is being flown. So it's a brand new core, uh, as opposed to we're gonna start seeing these blocks have like a point six soon. Uh, we have still at this point to see a Block 5 ever fly more than more than one reflight. So Block 5 has done reflights, um, but we've not, we have yet to see one fly three times. So um, start getting ready to see like Block 1049.6 and stuff like that. It'll be really exciting. Um, it'll become almost potentially boring and routine. But then look, we have, this is a big, heavy, 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 heavy satellite. This thing is 7,000 kilograms, just over, and it, that's over 15,000 pounds this is a tied basically right around the exact same weight as the other Telstar, uh, the 19V. And you might say, why did 19 launch before 18? Uh, they ordered them at the same time. Telstar did. They ordered 18 and 19 at the same time. And who knows, in manufacturing, one might have, you know, kind of had a better checkout procedure and had less issues. Um, you know, these things are really high-end satellites. They're really expensive. They're basically all custom made by SSL. Um which is Space Systems Laurel out in uh, California. But these things are, you know, they're really expensive. And there's a chance, too, that uh, that Telstar was like, hey, we need to actually, these are covering slightly different parts of the world. And there's a chance that one of the satellites was doing a little bit less, where 19 was going, you know, might need to replace a satellite that was doing a little bit worse than the one that 18 would be covering. So they launched it first, because they launched that in, I think, like July 22nd or something this year. It's just a couple months ago. So, and this thing is heading out to a geostationary transfer orbit, but there's something that I have, I tried to figure it out for you guys. I'm still a little, I'm hearing all sorts of things. Um, it's, since this satellite is so stinking heavy, it sounds like it goes into like, almost like a sub-geostationary transfer orbit. I don't want to quote, don't quote me as saying that, but it sounds like the satellite itself almost has, not a, a kick stage, because it doesn't separate, but it does have an extra like hydrazine thruster and four ion thrusters for station keeping. And it sounds like it might need to eke a little bit of its own extra delta V or something. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. But that's, people are saying, you know, how can it launch a heavy satellite and still recover the, the booster? That might be how. Uh, I I don't exactly know. So let's keep going on this. This is, so this is heading out to a geostationary orbit. Um, it will be at 138 degrees east for its final parking orbit once the satellite circularizes itself because it will just go into an elliptical orbit with the Falcon 9 and then over a long period of time it will circularize itself into a geostationary orbit. And that's an orbit, of course, that is 24 hours. So it looks down at the same point on the Earth. It ends up looking like a fixed point in the sky. So that's a geostationary orbit. And that's different from, you know, uh, a low Earth orbit, like where the International Space Station is. That takes... Um, the International Space Station orbits every 90 minutes, so it's a lot closer. It's only, you know, 400 kilometers up or so. Uh, so it's a lot it's a lot closer to us, therefore it's, it's faster. The further away you get in your orbit, the slower it actually is. Um, so these geostationary orbits are 24-hour periods, so that's all this is. And they're attempting to land this on, of course, I still love you, but there's a ton of storms. That's why this has been delayed today. It's already been delayed 45 minutes. So that also is taking into effect these huge swells out in the ocean. If this thing lands on these rough seas, this might be the spiciest landing um, successful to date, but we are hoping to see it back. You know, SpaceX is planning on reusing these boosters 10 times before they refurbish them. It would sure be a shame to lose a brand new booster today. So super fingers crossed. We'll see. 
Um, and obviously, they don't recover fairings out on the west on the east coast right now. They only are doing that on the west coast. I have my theory about that. I think it's something about you know for them to d- make design changes in their iterations and designs. Uh, I the west coast cadence is probably about right. They can make changes to the boat out there. That I don't. I just think it, it makes sense in their in their pace of innovation on, on how they're recovering fairings to only do it every couple months to attempt until they figure it out. And then of course they'll have a fairing catching boat out on the East Coast as well. But for now, only West Coast. This is an East Coast launch. This is out of Slick 40, Space Launch Complex 40 in Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Um, Yeah, and then they don't recover second stages, but this is going to be the 61st flight of a Falcon 9 16th mission for SpaceX in 2018. 29th successfully landed core, if it lands. So, yeah, so if you guys ever need questions about, you know, what is this stuff, just go to my website, everydayastronaut.com, click on pre-launch previews, you'll get an up-to-date, if you click on it, you'll see we actually keep the launch manifest days up-to-date, if you hover over it, it shows you your the countdown to the actual launch, it's a pretty slick website, I have a lot of really smart people helping me out on this stuff, so thank you guys for all the help, uh, it's been amazing. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, guys, a lot, there's been... Some things that I do want to mention before SpaceX goes live. Um, so I'll go ahead and go full screen again real quick. Um, so first off, real quick, uh, Sean Cummings, I saw your comment earlier because we got scrubbed 45 minutes here too. Um, I will work on trying to figure out why the website is being blocked at your work. It shouldn't be a personal website. This is a news website, so we'll work on that. Uh, Renau, launches never get boring. You're exactly right. Gary, great to see you again. Thoughts on Gateway Foundation. Think they'll actually get something going, maybe with BFR launch support. You know, I'm not very familiar with the Gateway Foundation, unless you're talking about the Lunar Gateway, but I don't actually know what Gateway Foundation is. I would love to, I'll probably have to read up on that. Uh, WildX, love your streams. Thank you, WildX, for saying hi. Jeffrey Tripp, um, you should get your music on YouTube Music. Um, I will absolutely... Um, we will be talking about, I, I will be working, I'm actually working on getting all of it up on Spotify and YouTube as well. Um, I will be releasing three EPs by the, before the end of the year. I'm working on some really fun things to release it. Stay tuned, there'll be a lot of music heading your way. Well, it's actually the same music, but you can actually listen to it on like where you prefer to listen to instead of SoundCloud. So, and yes, we will talk about that here in a second. Cam, uh, Camillo, hello from Miami, Florida. Uh, hope you see it in the, so- in the sky, that'd be awesome. Good luck, hopefully the sky clears out a little bit. Um, SPFLSU. Hey, Tim, I'm watching with my girlfriend. Can you explain why we space nerds watch rocket launches? Also, any news on the CCP demonstration? So that's a good question. Why do we watch them? Um, you know, <laughs> that's actually a really, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, SPLL, SPLSU's girlfriend. To be honest, it's... It's about watching the evolution of these things. We're watching rockets get smarter and more reusable and better. Look at this SpaceX webcast is up. This is great. Let me make sure the quality is going to be good enough for you guys. It's it's about watching them evolve and we're seeing them do really cool things. Um, I don't know. It's just it's just exciting and especially as the commercial stuff as these commercial providers are making cooler and cooler rockets. They're giving us better access to them. So we're actually learning more and more about these things. We're able to watch these things um, do more and more impressive things like be reusable and bring the cost of space down cheaper so that we can eventually fly regular people to space and not, you know, especially trained astronauts. Only, you know, less than 600 humans have ever been to space. You know, we're on the cusp of it being a ton of people. Anyone can afford to go to space soon because of all this stuff. I think that's why it's exciting. We're just watching it. We're watching it hatch. It's a new era of space flight, and it's really exciting. Zachary, will uh, metallic hydrogen work as an SRB or liquid fuel? Um, Metallic hydrogen is still very, you know, it's kind of like solid state batteries and things that are on the cusp of things. I don't know. It would be a very powerful fuel because it's extremely, extremely energy dense. It'd be incredible. A tiny little bit could probably do what an entire rocket does now. Um, Well, let's see. Anything like that, I'm like, sure, let's, let's start demonstrating it. Let's start mass producing it. That's always a hard thing. Like carbon nanotubes are really hard to mass produce. We can make it in a lab in fine amounts, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Um, fellow Iowan checking in, Miles Miller. Thanks for saying hi. King Nothing 313, 313, or 313. Just became a patron. My streams are always the best. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for becoming a patron. That honestly means a lot. Speaking of, we have a giveaway to do tonight. We will be doing that on the coast phase. So if you are a Patreon supporter, uh, we have two people to give away pieces of flown space shuttle. Uh, I have those winners. 
in hand, and uh, we will be announcing that in the coast phase. So um, get ready for that. And also, we have another. I want to real quick, as talking about Patreon, if you want to help support and and be part of future giveaways. Head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And thanks to my Patreon supporters who are in my Discord channel. These people keep me sane. They're awesome. And they get exclusive. I, I check out that chat. And they answer a lot of questions for me, which is amazing. Because I have an awesome community who is getting the mind mentality and smartness of our community is like blowing my mind. I'm learning a ton from you guys. I hope we can just keep keep growing smarter together. It's an amazing community. So if you want to join that, patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. But I really quick, we need to talk about this before the launch because it's going to be something that's in the chat nonstop. This is all I'm going to say about this. Listen here. Elon Musk, the founder and owner of SpaceX, was on Joe Rogan's podcast recently and he did something controversial. I think if we focus on that and give it any attention... The, to me, it doesn't matter at all, at all. We're giving atten we're taking attention away from the aerospace engineers, the fellow SpaceX employees, his own hard work, and we're feeding into almost reality TV. I'm not about that. We're here for aerospace. So if you want to talk about aerospace, you're in the right place. If you want to talk about Elon Musk's personal life, go find I don't know Buzzfeed or something. That's just let's we're beyond that here. We're a great community of space enthusiasts. And if you're here to talk about Elon Musk's controversial personal choices, I, again, I personally, I don't smoke myself, but I don't care. He, he's in a state where it's legal. I don't care. It doesn't matter. That's not, that has nothing to do with aerospace. I don't care. Keep making awesome things and keep cheering along the aerospace engineers that are doing incredible things for humanity. That's all that matters, period. So that being said, we're not going to talk about that anymore. Let's not even, just, if I see it in the chat, I'm going to have mods starting to silence it. So just, who cares? We're moving on. And we are so excited for tonight's launch. It's been a long time. It's been a very long time since we've seen a SpaceX launch. I'm elated. It feels like it's been too, too, too long. So, all right. So, um, oh, very quick. Um, Mary, let's see. Whoa. Uh, Chris B says... They're fueling. That is great. Uh, fueling is a good thing. They do that T-minus 35 minutes. The fact that they started their web, webcast is a good thing as well. Um, Matthew, a launch is just not the same without you. You live in Tampa and can normally see launches from the bay, but cloud cover is really heavy tonight. You're absolutely right. Any hope of getting your amazing music on amazing music on Google Music? Yes, it will all be up. Um, I will have three EPs out before the end of the year. Each one will have a really cool release that you'll see soon. Um, I'm working hard. There's a lot of things behind the scenes that I hope you guys are excited about because I'm really excited about it. So uh, we're working on it. So thank you, Matthew. Um, Mary Smith, hi from Oklahoma. Your webcasts are the best. You always learn something from you. Well, thank you. Keep it up and keep up the awesome videos. Thank you, Mary. We have a lot of awesome other videos coming out soon. I have two that I've edited and like shot and scripted. That's the hard part. I just have to put the final touches on them. Um, and time them right with events. But I have this long script that I've been working on for a long time with a friend, Space Mike from tomorrow. Um, that's going to take priority now. So, yeah. Thank you very much. And Samuel, thank you for the tip. Quinn Taylor, hey, love watching these late night streams. Sucks these have to happen on school nights. But being tired is worth waiting to, worth watching a Falcon 9 launch. Amen. Um, I have to get up really early tomorrow. So I really hope it doesn't scrub anymore. Uh, Jacoby, thank you. Hey, long time watcher. First time actually catching one of your casts live. How goes the Project Mars competition? Great question, uh, Jacoby. So I was, I'm a judge for this Project Mars competition that, um, invited people to make films and posters, uh, about going to Mars. And it's, it was partnered with NASA and, um, SLS and Orion team. It's a really cool competition. The winner's going to get $10,000 for the film, $1,500 for the poster. It's really cool. I haven't heard much more about it yet. I think we're going to be judging here really soon, actually, uh, in which case I'm really excited about it. So uh, stay tuned. You'll hopefully we'll find more about it. Uh, hopefully we'll learn more who the winners are very soon. So I can't wait. Good, good question. Um, Tuba Horse, it's also been too long since I've said hello. Thank you, Tuba Horse. Thank you. And uh, Ridvak Gopal, your enthusiasm for space is contagious. Thank you. Well, these guys just... And these people, sorry, they they inspire me. And you know, I've been I've been just absolutely smitten by spaceflight. And I'm just here to be excited and and hope. You know, 
I've been, I've been so obsessed that I learn as much as I can that I'm just here to tell you guys what I know. And it, it's limited. <laughs> I'm not an expert on this stuff, but I am obsessed, so I might as well tell you what I know. And I'm just glad that you guys are here to, to hang out with me. So thank you. Uh, this The Spectre 91, huge fan. I'm looking forward to the future live cast, including DM1 and 2. DM1, so Demonstration Flights 1 and 2 are going to be incredible. That is going to be Crew Dragon, so that's the difference of um, Dragon 1 is over here in my Falcon 9. Dragon 2 is right here. That's the one that will be having people in it. Check out my video. I was at SpaceX like three or four weeks ago, about four weeks ago. Um, I got to see the spacesuit. I poked my head around in, in a Dragon capsule, Dragon version 2, um, a Crew Dragon capsule. It's going to be amazing seeing these things fly. They look unbelievable if you haven't watched that video please watch it send it to a friend tell them why it's cool tell them i tell them you sent me you know or you tell them you sent i don't know finish that sentence yourself um hot cup of coffee tomorrow tmro from groovy thank you um ramir thank you thank you and samuel i can't believe you're from iowa you go to uh uh morningside college in sioux city just created a rocket club here that's awesome uh, you can you can get me there um, on my website everydayastronaut.com. Go to public speaking. I can come and talk and hang out and do all sorts of fun stuff. Contact me through there. Um, yeah, but guys, we're gonna pull this up. It is webcast time. I'm gonna put this here. I think. It is September 10th, just after 12:30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and you are looking at a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket with the Telstar 18 Vantage spacecraft on top, awaiting liftoff from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Good evening from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. My name is John Innsbrucker. I'm the Falcon Principal Integration Engineer, and I'll be your host for tonight's webcast. I love John. Tonight, we are launching the Telstar 18 Vantage spacecraft to a geostationary transfer orbit. Liftoff is planned for 12.45 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, or 04.45 Universal Time, coming up just some 12 minutes and 40 seconds from now. This will be SpaceX's 16th launch of this year, and today we will be flying a brand new Block 5 booster, which we will be attempting to land on our East Coast drone ship named, of course, I Still Love You. Look at it, it's all shiny. It's weird to see a shiny one these days. Normally they get all burnt up looking after they're reused. So, he's probably gonna start talking here in a second, but I'll remind you that that is not smoke, that's condensation. Just like if you were to pull out like a really cold soda in a warm, humid day, you see condensation. For today's mission, it. we're launching out of historic Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. This is one of SpaceX's two East Coast launch sites. On the pad, through a couple of drops of rain which have now left the area, you can see the two-stage Falcon 9 vehicle standing 70 meters tall, greater than the wingspan of a Boeing 747. The first stage is powered by nine Merlin 1D engines, and they do the bulk of the work to carry Falcon 9 from the ground into the vacuum of space. First stage will separate about 67 kilometers up. Our second stage, which is visible on the webcast just above the black colored interstage, has a single Merlin vacuum engine, which ignites after stage one separates. The second stage is what will carry Telstar 18 Vantage to geostationary transfer orbit, or GTL. It will take two burns of the upper stage engine to do that. The spacecraft is currently sitting inside of the 17 foot diameter payload fairing on top of the second stage you can see the fairing with the customer's decals on it. About 30 seconds after ignition of the second stage, we will jettison the two fairing halves in the vacuum of space. Stage two, still with Telstar 18V on top of it, will continue its journey into the first of two orbits planned for early this morning. Now alongside of the Falcon 9, slightly obscuring the view is the truss structure. We call it the transport erector, or TE. That's what we use to roll the rocket out to the pad and support it in its vertical position as you see on the screen now. The transport erector also provides power, data, and air conditioning connections to the Falcon 9 rocket. Today's mission is the fifth flight of our Block 5 vehicle design. Block 5 represents a series of upgrades to Falcon 9 
designed to allow us to reuse each Falcon 9 10 times or more, as well as reduce the refurbishment time needed between flights. Uh, Miles Miller, Midwest Meetup is a great idea. I think we, we should do that. Maybe you guys should all join me in Cedar Falls, where I live, Northeast Iowa. Hmm? Let's do it. Let's do it. They all they do call the strong back and the transport T minus director. nine yeah. minutes and thirty seven seconds in counting. And as I like to say on the webcast, the good news is the SpaceX and spacecraft teams are working no significant issues right now. On the Falcon 9 side, the team came on console at T minus two hours, gave their goes for launch, and we began propellant loading at T minus thirty five minutes. Currently, the second stage fuel tank is completely loaded. Meanwhile, first stage fuel is going on board and we are loading liquid oxygen onto both the first and second stages. The liquid oxygen loading will end between T minus three minutes and T minus two minutes before launch. On the spacecraft side, the team is go for launch. We just heard that they have completed transfer of the spacecraft from ground power to the onboard batteries that finished up at T minus 15 minutes. There's no further commanding plan of the spacecraft before launch. They're ready to go. On the range side, we're flying out of the Air Force's eastern range. They have the airspace and the ocean areas clear for launch right now. They've also been giving us weather forecasts, releasing weather balloons. We've obviously been delayed early this morning for weather. We've been delayed 77 minutes. We've had rain, lightning, and thick clouds, but the weather officer says that's all clearing out right now, so the weather looks good for an on-time launch 45 minutes after the hour. Now the launch window was four hours long. We've now got two hours and 43 minutes left in it when we get to T0. There is the possibility if we hold in the last minutes of the count, we could try again tonight. That of course depends upon what causes us to hold the count down and whether we can resolve it quickly. But if we are able to, we might have enough time to load another batch of cold liquid oxygen onto the Falcon 9 and try again later in the window. So in summary, Falcon 9's looking good. The spacecraft team's on internal power. They're ready to fly. The range says we're clear. And the weather appears to be cooperating for a launch just over seven and a half minutes from now. Sweet. So uh, yeah, to reiterate, notice on the top right hand corner of your screen is the T minus and seven minutes and 23 seconds as I'm looking at it now. Um, the, the quick reminder that I always want to remind people is the reason the rocket is looks like it's has smoke pouring off it it's condensation it's the same thing if you're opening a freezer in like a really Today, warm day SpaceX is launching Telstar 18 Vantage a powerful new satellite in the Telesat fleet that will enable communication services on the ground in the air and at sea built for Telesat by SSL Telstar 18 Vantage will significantly expand Telesat's capacity over Asia including growing markets in China, Mongolia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific Ocean. Its high throughput capabilities will provide broad geographical coverage as well as focus coverage, which is important for bandwidth intensive applications like satellite TV. Telstar 18 Vantage is Telesat's second high throughput satellite to launch this summer in partnership with SSL and SpaceX. SSL, which is based in Palo Alto, California, builds both geostationary and low Earth orbit satellites and to date has more commercial geostationary satellites on orbit than any other manufacturer. Sweet. So hopefully, he, I, I don't want to ever talk over them because I end up learning things from the experts all the time. So um, again, condensation. It's really cold. The rocket right now is insanely cold. Um, the liquid oxygen that's on board in the in the fuel tanks, uh, in the propellant tanks, I guess. T-minus five minutes, 45 seconds. Everything continues to look good for launch of Falcon 9 with Telstar 18 Vantage. Now, during the discussion on the satellite, we heard the call out that MVAC Merlin engine chill-in has begun. That happens at T-minus seven minutes. Another major activity that will be happening in less than a minute and a half at T minus four minutes, 10 seconds, the cradle arms on the transport erector will open. So we might be able to get a close up view of that. The arms will open and the strong back will then recline slightly away from the Falcon 9 starting about 10 seconds after that. 
We'll hear the call out that the transport erector is in position at about 88.2 degrees. Once we get to T0, the erector is hydraulically reclined away from the Falcon 9 to about 77 degrees. Falcon 9 then clears the erector at liftoff. You've heard just the, you've now heard the call out. The stages are pressing for strong back retract. That's getting ready to open the arms and recline the transport erector. Now currently on Falcon 9, fuel is completely loaded on the first stage now. We're still loading liquid oxygen on the first and second stages. If we've got the pad mics up, you may be hearing the hiss and pop of pressure venting from the rocket, as well as the plumbing that's on the transport erector. The white clouds you see around the rocket, that's the moist Florida atmosphere. It's condensing around the areas where the cold gaseous oxygen is vented overboard. We've also got gaseous oxygen venting from the base of the Falcon 9. That's due to chilling in those Merlin turbo pumps that began at T minus seven minutes. The liquid oxygen chills the pump on each engine and then it's vented overboard. Now, once we finish loading liquid oxygen at T minus two minutes, the last major vent in the countdown will happen at T minus one. That's when the flight computers on the Falcon 9 take control. You'll hear the countdown net, Falcon 9 is in startup. We've also heard just now that the recline is underway of the transport erector. And we've also heard TVC motions acceptable. That's the last minute wiggles of the upper stage engine actuators to make sure that everything has been checked out as close to launch as we can. Now, meanwhile, I was talking about Falcon 9 and startup at T minus one minutes. The computers will light the Merlin engines at about T minus two seconds and liftoff will be commanded at T zero. So with all systems go on Falcon 9, the spacecraft, the range and the weather, let's listen to the last few minutes of the countdown. Yay! <laughs> it's happening! Uh, this is looking good. So again, reminder, uh, the the strong back or the transport erector, the strong back is actually just the part that is there. The transport erector is kind of the whole entire thing. Uh, think about it like this whole thing, uh, including like the base, is the transport erector, or is this is the transport erector, and just the like white part is the strong back. Um, and yeah, it, it retracts a tiny bit here before launch, and then uh, right at T minus zero, it swings down really fast, and that keeps all those. There's a lot of like plumbing and and all that stuff connected to the vehicle uh, right now to, to fuel it and to provide electricity. Um, and we want to get those things as far away from the rocket as humanly possible, so that all these nasty flames shooting out of the back end of those nine Merlin engines, uh, producing nearly two million pounds of thrust, uh, so they don't just totally destroy the strong back every time it takes off. Um, it requires a lot less refurbishment when it does that quick recline. Um, the two launch pads on the east coast do the quick retract like that. Slick 40 and um, Slick 30 and and uh, and launch complex 39A but on the west coast Slick 4E uh, they still have the old school one where it goes back to like 77 degrees and just stays there and then the rocket ends up <laughs> half destroying everything. Stage 2 locks um, locally. Yeah, so thank you first of all Julian, Falcon thank you. That's awesome. I hope to see the next Falcon Heavy or BFR test. That would be amazing. I hope so too. Thank you for your support. Miles, it's like how dry ice smokes. Exactly. I was hoping to say something like that. Jason, will the BFR fuel up the same as the Falcon or is there a different process in place? Um, it will be quite different um, because they're dealing with methane, so I think the timing will be different. Um, I'm not entirely sure how that's going to look, What's this gonna, what that's going to look like. I'm sure they're going to be, I assume they're going to be using densified oxygen as well. Maybe not. Maybe they don't need it with methane. That's a, a big performance boost for using liquid oxygen and, and liquid um, and an RP1, you know, kerosene basically. And... Um, although, you know, that provides a boost in anything because it is more dense, you get more in the rocket. It might not be necessary with the, the Raptor, who knows? I don't well, know I anything about up. that yet. Um, so there might be a little different fuel procedure. So fingers crossed we'll see uh, rather soon. So thank you. Stan, thank you. And Matt, Stage two, uh, you should do a video on, uh, of a launch with Amy where you two just hand signal the entire launch procedure just for grins. I'll ask her if she wants to take part in that. Um, she'd probably be quite good at that as well. Maybe someone will hire us on an airline to do all the like seatbelt stuff, you know, that stuff. All right, here we go, guys. We are T minus 25 seconds. I think it's going to go. I'm glad the weather cleared out. This is good for me because I might actually get to bed at a decent time. And they did say they would have the potential to Stay maybe reset. That used to not really seconds. be an option with this super chill. They do have four launch normally. 
because the tanks have to push so much of it in right at the last eight, minute, they seven, wouldn't be able to retank. Six, so let's listen in here. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Yes. Lift off. Yes. Look at that camera from so far away shaking. That's crazy. Right. Looking good. Whoa, passing through the clouds. That looks awesome. I'm going to go infrared. I was on the east coast to see this thing right now. Power telemetry nominal. 47 seconds into flight. We just heard the tail end of avionics call out nominal. Falcon 9 heading through the clouds at Cape Canaveral. Powered on 1.7 million pounds of thrust. We're throttled down for passing through maximum dynamic pressure. Sweet. Yeah, so now they actually slow down or deaccelerate a little bit. Vehicle supersonic. That's a cool shot. We're supersonic, heading out of the Earth's atmosphere. Vehicle has reached maximum aerodynamic pressure. And now the call out, we're through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure. As we get into the thinner areas of Earth's atmosphere, the loads are now decreasing on the Falcon 9. Yes, excellent. It's looking good so far. It is screaming now already. we're getting ready for chill-in of the upper stage engine. Similar to the first stage, we'll begin flowing liquid oxygen to the pumps. And we've heard the call out, MVAC D chilling has begun. Now coming up, just past two and a half minutes into flight, the nine Merlin 1D engines you see here from the ground camera will shut down. A few seconds later, the stage will separate and then the upper stage engine will ignite to begin propelling the spacecraft to the first of two orbits for the evening. Two minutes, eight seconds into flight, Trajectory looks good. Merlin engine chamber pressures look good. Notice now that it's in higher altitude where the atmosphere is a lot thinner, uh, the exhaust gas, since it's so high pressure, is actually expanding out. And that's why you start to see all nine engines look like they're pushing Coming out. Coming so up much. on shutdown. Here we go. They're going to be shut and get ready to see the speed drop for a second as it coasts up. Right there. There we go. Stage separation here. Looks good. Stage, Stage two ignition. Separation confirmed. That's important. MVAC ignition. And we've heard the call out MVAC ignition. The chamber is up on power. Engine's looking good on stage two. Meanwhile, stage one is now coasting. You can just see the grid fins, the titanium grid fins on the first stage opening on the left view. That's cool. First stage is now going to begin drifting down towards the drone ship. Meanwhile, we're coming up in 15 seconds on fairing separation. That's really cool. Fairing sep is extremely important. If those fairings don't pop off, the satellite's stuck inside. Stage two on nominal trajectory. There we go. Bearing separation confirmed. Looks good. And a nice view, and you can hear the applause from the folks outside Mission Control here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. The two fairing halves have separated in the vacuum of space. Now, as a reminder, on this flight, the fairings do not have recovery systems. We did not put parachutes in, so there's no I plan to recover the, the fairings. We've heard acquisition of signal call out from Bermuda. That's our tracking site in Bermuda. Has the telemetry from the Falcon 9. You know what's cool? The second, second stage, stage continues is be... to perform well. We're carrying Telstar 18 Vantage to the low Earth parking orbit. We should get into orbit about eight and a half minutes into flight. Uh, we're actually going to see the second stage go towards the sun. It's going to experience sunrise here really soon, actually. Um, I don't know if it might be burning even still by the time it gets into into. Now, currently, north. first stage continues to coast. It's arcing up to apogee and now beginning to descend down towards the drone ship. 
As a reminder, on this mission, it's a geostationary transfer orbit mission. There is no boost back burn to bring it back to Cape Canaveral for a land landing. This first stage recovery will use two burns to land on the drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean, currently parked about 635 kilometers offshore. This is the typical, this is the typical profile for a GTO mission. Five minutes, 15 seconds into flight, the Merlin vacuum engine on stage two continues to look excellent. Trajectory is good, and we're waiting for entry burn of the first stage in less than a minute. I hope they get some footage. I love seeing re-entry burns. Um, sometimes they get the shot looking down the rocket from the interstage looking down towards the engines. And the, you see the grid fins there. They, they showed it for a second right after stage separation on the left screen. And when it's re-entering, you see the, the, uh, the plasma buildup um, as the bow shock waves around each grid fin gets super compressed air and turns it into super hot plasma. You see now it we're coming up going crazy. T plus six minutes. Second like stage continues to perform nominally. First stage is preparing for its entry burn coming up in about 17 seconds. This will be a 23 second burn. We light three engines on the first stage to begin slowing us down as we pass into the atmosphere. Um, Zachary wants to know what happens if fairings don't deploy. It's a mission failure. Um, that actually happened one time, OG, OG01, um, orbiting obs carbon observatory or something, one, OC01. Stage one entry startup. Um, it was in like probably 2005 or something or 2009. You see um, ignition, the three Merlin engines at power, back it, illuminating it, those it, titanium it, grid fins. Trajectory. Such a cool shot. Uh, but it was a Delta II, and the fairing did not deploy, and therefore the payload was stuck in there, and the second stage, because it didn't shed that weight, was unable to get into orbit. Stage 1 so entry shut down. It's very bad. And shutdown of stage 1. That completes the entry burn. Coming up at T plus 8 minutes, just shortly after that, we will get the landing burn of the first stage. It's rough seas out there, guys, so we'll see. Seven minutes into flight, everything continues to go well on the second stage. Propulsion's good. Trajectory is good. We're about to go transonic on the first stage as it quickly enters the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, the payload ended up burning up on reentry on the Delta II on OC01. Um, it couldn't make it into orbit, so it, on like a couple passes or even the first pass in orbit. Time we should be going transonic um, on first stage. That puts us less than 60 seconds away from landing. Right now the vehicle is passing through 900 miles an hour. That'll give you an idea of the deceleration that's coming up in the span of less than a minute. will reduce from over twice the speed of a jet all the way down to zero as the rocket lands. So There will be many events coming zero. up here very shortly. Landing burn ignition. Second stage goes into orbit, and then the first stage lands. Let's listen and watch. AFTS has saved. All right. Okay, that's the first stage of landing, landing burn. We have single engine startup on the first stage for landing. We're getting views from the onboard Safe camera. Now remember, this is in the middle of the ocean, so the views often cut out. Back Satellite down. downlinks are very bad out there, and stage the rocket's one, shaking. Ooh. We almost got a full, a full shot without it cutting. And we're waiting for confirmation on first stage on the drone ship. They're cheering to landing. Hopefully the seas aren't too rough to throw it off. We don't have a view, but we hear recovery calling out Falcon 9 has landed. Also importantly, in the background just now, we had second stage engine shutdown on time. Guidance, navigation, and control engineer confirms we have a nominal orbit. That's the parking orbit, the first of two planned. So, so far, first stage looks good on the drone ship. Second stage is in the desired parking orbit. Now, our next events are restart of the upper stage engine at T plus 26 minutes, 17 seconds, and then deployment of Telstar 18V almost six minutes later. So right now, I'm gonna pause live commentary, but I'll be back in about 15 and a half minutes at T plus 25 minutes, 30 seconds, and we'll bring you the restart of the upper stage engine, followed by deployment of the Telstar 18V satellite.
All right, but that's why we stick around here, guys. Uh, this is when we get to talk about some of the extra nerdy things. Um, so maybe they'll show us, they sometimes might show us a real quick shot too. Um, looks like we aren't going to be so lucky today. So um, uh, first off, uh, so yeah, so to finish that story about when the fairing didn't deploy on OC01, um, basically the fairing, because it weighed the second stage down, it didn't have enough Delta V to actually get itself into orbit. And therefore, I think it burnt up just on the other side of the globe. It re-entered too soon. Um, and the payload is stuck inside there anyway. It's like if like, you had a garage door that couldn't open and you're trying to go out to do a race, you know, you're a race car and you're in your you're in your garage door and all of a sudden you're like, all right, open the garage door, let's let it rip. And then uh, the garage door is stuck. Uh, it's totally shut. All the power went out in the whole complex. Uh, the race already started, so now it's too late. It's one time shot and you're done. So it'd be kind of like that. So it's very bad. Payload fairing has to deploy. That would be, that's mission critical. Very important. Um, I did want to talk about COPV, COPV 2.0. That's the um, compo composite overwrap pressure vessel. That's basically um, these aluminum tanks that are inside the fuel tanks and the oxidizer tanks. Um, there's a whole bunch of them in these vehicles. I mean, we're talking like over a dozen in the vehicle uh, in the first stage and the second stage. Multiple COPVs in each tank even. Um, in each, you know, so there's tons of them. And they're then wrapped really tightly with carbon fiber so it can hold insane amounts of pressure, like tens of thousands of PSI. And that's what happens then as the fuel drains, they fill that pressure with, with helium, which is inert, so it doesn't explode. And it's really, really, really compressible. And so it can expand out and fill up that gap so that you don't have fuel sloshing around. Um, and so that it makes sure there's no like bubbles going into the turbo pumps and going into the engines. That's what the COPVs do. And there's a bunch of them inside the rocket. And SpaceX has had two, only two failures with their, in their 61 launches um, on their boosters. And both of them were in the upper stage oxygen tank and due to some form of COPV failure where um, in one of them uh, on CRS, CRS-7, which I believe was like June 30th, 2015, uh, around there. Uh, basically there's struts that hold these COPVs in and the COPVs actually are buoyant and they actually want to go up, even though the vehicle is pr producing like, you know, three G's of acceleration downward, the COPV bottles actually want to go up due to buoyancy. It's really weird. Um, Smarter Every Day, I think, did a really good video about that if you want to read up, or maybe it was Scott Manley. One of those two did a really cool video explaining how buoyancy works backwards of what you might think sometimes. Um, and what happens is the strut broke. The COPV released a bunch of pressure and overpressurized the tank. The tank exploded. The rocket was lost. Um, also, Amos 6, September 1st, 2016, uh, was their last failure. And that um, a COPV had a, a failure instantaneously reacting with the super chilled propellants, um, buckling the carbon fiber and, and forcing the COPV open. And it just ruptured on the launch pad um, during a, a static fire event. So um, these COPVs you know, they're pushing the boundaries of how much performance they can get out of the entire vehicle. And the COPVs um, became kind of a finicky thing. So SpaceX goes, all right, we're going to start over. We're going to make this bulletproof COPV, literally, apparently, bulletproof COPV called the COPV 2.0. And this thing is going to be so stinking strong. Um, and that will be flying. That needs to fly seven times before they can put humans on it, which is going to be happening next year already with for NASA's commercial crew program. Um and they still have yet, even though they've been flying Block 5 um, for a few months now, uh, they have yet to fly a COPV 2.0. It does sound like they're hoping to do that, I believe, in November-ish for DM-1, Demonstration Mission 1 of the Crew Dragon capsule. <sighs> COPV 2.0, there we go. We're all, t we're all caught up on that. Uh, yeah. I think that's all we need to talk about there. Uh, so I, we have something really exciting to talk about right now, and that's giveaway time. Who's ready? So again, we do giveaways every 100 Patreons, uh, every 100 patron members. If you want a chance to win, we're coming up on a thousand patrons. If you want a chance to win really cool things, I don't actually have new stuff yet for a thousand, but I'm doing something really cool for a thousand. I promise. Um, head on over to patreoncom slash everydayastronaut. Um, some people, we have a winner for this piece of flown space shuttle and a winner for this piece of flown space shuttle, and. Um, Thank you for your support on Patreon, everyone. That's the reason I can do this. That's the reason I can stay up late and and cover this stuff. That's the reason I can spend 60 hours a week producing videos, working my butt off. It's for you guys, and I couldn't do it without my Patreon supporters. So this is my way to say thank you. 
Um, these are people that have contributed anywhere from a dollar to whatever amount per month. Um, for every dollar someone gives, it kind of puts their name in a, a hat. Um, it's actually a spreadsheet, and we did this really cool thing. Um, but here we go. You guys ready for this? Congratulations to James Peak. You have won this lovely piece of flown space shuttle. <laughs> Let's round of applause for James. Thank you, James, for your support. Thank you. And again, this is weighted by current contributions. And these were people that uh, that actually went through billing of the last month. So James, thank you for, I can actually officially say thank you for your support. I will be contacting you to make sure your, uh, you know, your address is right. And I will be framing these babies up and getting you that. All right. And second person to win this piece of flown space shuttle. Uh, it's right over here, this little piece of rope. I don't actually know what it is. That other one's filler gap. I don't know what this is. But, rope seal. Ha la la la! Okay, there we go. So, congratulations to Christopher, uh, Bjarkfer. I probably slaughtered your name. But hopefully you're excited that you get this. I will be signing, I will be sending you a little note, some stickers, and some fun stuff. So, thank you, uh, Christopher. Your support really means a lot. And thank you also to our 900 and something Patreon supporters. You guys are the best. If you want a chance to win more Spaceflight hardware, uh, hang out on our exclusive Discord channel, uh, hang out on our exclusive subreddit, um, and just kind of be on the front edge of anything exciting that's happening here. A lot of behind the scenes stuff. You get first dibs, you get to see videos as they're being produced. Um, it's a lot of fun and you learn a lot because I'm learning constantly from these people. So thank you. Uh, and again, we will be doing uh, a giveaway at a thousand and it's gonna be a big giveaway um, Everyone in my discord channel has been talking about corn because I live in Iowa. You are right I will be sending you 4,241 pieces of Iowa corn At a thousand patrons, so congrats to whoever that will be Hopefully it's me. Hopefully it's my parents Mom and dad Hope you like corn. All right, so oh is Al oh yeah so <laughs> my discord channel is going crazy yeah so thank you winners um that really 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 means a lot and also guys i do need to remind you that i have tons of new really cool shirts like this one rocket science science it says science because science rocket 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 science rocket science science can be on your shirt on your shirt for you and for me you can get those over at everydayastronaut.com shop Take a look around. We got that. We got this cool Apollo blueprint shirt that I love. Um, we got lots of other fun stuff, lots of prints. Um, this F1 rocket shirt. I'm going to be doing a lot of cool exclusive shirts coming out too. Um, I probably could have made this big enough that you can see it. Uh, yeah, like cool shirts and stuff. So go to everydayastronaut.com slash shop if you guys want to get nerdy space stuff and be as uh, dorky as I am. Yeah, this is another one. That's my helmet that I'm currently not wearing at all all right so let's bring let's bring the launch back up and get ready for it to let's answer some questions so again thank you guys thank you thank you thank you you have changed my life literally um i can professionally be a space nerd a cheerleader for aerospace industry so thank you really really thank you all right so um so let's see um <laughs> it seems like they haven't had bfr let's see wow Thank you guys, there's so many, okay, I gotta, greetings from Italy, sudden delays are the most annoying thing about space launches, the three in a row this time, keep up the good work, Tim, thank you, Plastic Pinocchio, thank you, and hi, uh, Blair, I wish they'd show fuel amounts in each stage, like in Kerbal Space Program, that'd be amazing, but that might be giving too much away of their, like, you know, trade secrets and stuff, um, Takate, GT5, uh, loving watching it from my roof, don't even need to get to the Max Brewer Bridge, when you come down, let us know, uh, keep up the content. It's awesome. Thank you. I will be. I'll. I do give up. Give or I do um Patreon meetups anytime I'm in Florida or anytime I'm out near like SpaceX and California and stuff. Um, bigger cities because if I do meetups in like random places, no one comes. So I'll do. I'll be doing some meetups. Um, and thank you for your support, Morgan. There has not been many much BFR slash BFS news in a while. Do you know why? Uh, what any of their testing and production targets are? I'd love to see a work in progress picture of the BFR, wouldn't you? Uh, yes, I would absolutely love an update. We were supposed to get an update soon, according to Elon. I still have not heard if they're attending IAC, the International Aeronautical Congress, uh, which is taking place in Germany this year in October. 
Uh, I was at the one two years ago in, in Mexico. Still don't know if it's happening. And I would love for it to happen. I would love nothing more to get a really cool presentation like we've gotten for the past two years. We've gotten very spoiled. I'm dying, absolutely dying to get some uh, some new <laughs> some new uh, BFR news. Uh, by the way, for those of you who don't know, BFR is their next generation rocket. It's going to be the biggest, most powerful rocket ever. It's huge. It has like 30 engines that are methane powered and super crazy powerful and fully reusable and absolutely incredible. And as far as news, I, we are still hearing they're planning to hop, um, kind of like grasshopper type little spaceships that are probably stripped down, but just to learn, you know, the controls of the methane engines. Uh, we're still hearing they might be hopping those at the end of 2019, so in about a year. That would be amazing because they're still targeting Mars uh, uncrewed in 2022 and sending humans to Mars. They're still saying 2024, <sighs> which would be amazing. So we'll see. Um, and why are they not using methane for Falcon 9? Different engine. It is an entirely, the Raptor is an entirely different engine. To date, no one has really flown a methane powered engine, but it has a lot of advantages. It's, it burns clean. It's great for reusability because it doesn't have any of that nasty, um, there's not soot all over like RP1. RP1 has a ton of carbon and it dirties up the entire engine. It's really bad for reusability actually. Um, hydrogen is, would be better for reusability like the space shuttle. But uh, methane is kind of the best of a lot of worlds, and you can manufacture methane on Mars. So it's really easy to, to land on Mars, refuel um, with methane, and come home. And that's very important when you're sending humans to Mars. Uh, so the Falcon 9 is just an entirely different architecture. Redesigning it to fly with methane, you might as well just start, you're, you're starting over anyway. So you might as well make a big Falcon rocket. So that's why. Um, T. Rini, you're one of the best rocket hosts I've ever seen. Love the uh, gesticulation. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I hope that's okay. Oh, and I've been waiting for this launch in Norway. It's currently 6.55 a.m. Time for bed soon. Oh, you haven't been to bed. Get to bed, T. Rini, and thank you for your support. That's crazy. Joseph, it was a Taurus XL that had the fairing failure in 2009. Ah. Thank you. Was it a Taurus? Well, OCO one I thought launched on a Delta two. I don't know. You might be right, but thank you, um, Dennis. I live in California, and we have earthquakes. What happens if there is an earthquake right before the rocket is to launch? I don't know. I don't know if that's ever happened at Vandenberg. Um, maybe they. That's a great. I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't know if there's case studies for it. Maybe it'd just be such a rare coincidence and timing that it's just not even a consideration. I have no idea. That's a crazy question. Uh, it probably wouldn't be good. And depending on the magnitude of the earthquake, it could potentially be very not good. So, yeah, let's let's just say, let's hope it doesn't happen. Let's hope we don't find out. And thank you. Tom, what's the latest on Falcon Heavy? There isn't the latest, but I'm I'm still thinking, I've been saying for a little while, I, I would be surprised if we actually see one launch again in 2018. I, I'm thinking it'll be really close to a one-year anniversary Falcon Heavy launch. Um, just, that's just my gut instinct. I just knowing how these things kind of slip and push back and being obsessed with this stuff for four or five years now, I, it just tends to be how this stuff works. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if it gets into early 2019. Um, that's personal speculation, but I haven't heard anything that has made me optimistic for it staying in November uh, of this year. Um, Matt W, the most serious question, what brand of beer trimmer do you use? An awful one. I need a new one. If you guys know of an actual good beard trimmer, I was just looking at some on Amazon like the other day and it is so overwhelming all the garbage and junk reviews and I'm like I want to spend a decent amount because I want something that will last and I do a terrible job of beard up upkeep if you guys know of a way to trim a beard properly please let me know please I'm crying I'm crying over here FC guy how do they chill the densified liquid fuel I think like literally giant like freezers basically some kind of piping and tanks that you know a condenser it can make the tanks really cold i've always actually wondered that how do you get something crazy 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 i, I think literally like a, a massive crazy freezer i think if someone knows let me know uh my discord channel is just full of corn that's a rocket that's all i'm seeing in discord right now you guys are absolutely no help <laughs> Elon Musk. Okay. 
You just won. You just won for the night. Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've been fighting a cold, too, and I made the mistake of running tonight, and my lungs are just, like, dying. Don't make me laugh anymore, guys. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Thank you, guys. All right, so, um, oh, and and, pla and Plastic Pinocchio, by any chance, do you know what's the maximum theoretical speed at which the first stage could return to the landing pad without breaking to pieces all the way across the stratosphere? Um, so... It currently gets up to about, I think, 66 to 7,000 kilometers an hour. Uh, is about as fast as it re-enters. And I think that's about as fast as it can handle um, while it re-enters before the atmosphere. And it needs to do that that boost back burn, or the, the re-entry burn, in order to survive re-entry. We talk about that. I've had a couple of videos where I talk about that quite a bit. Launch. Second stage has been coasting as it left the east coast of the U.S., it's now over Africa, crossing the equator, where we're going to complete the coast phase and reignite the second stage engine. This will happen in about 20 seconds. We plan on a 44 second burn to carry Telstar 18V from low Earth parking orbit to GTO. So it's venting, purging. It's the engine's oxygen. in startup. That's what you're seeing there. Reignition. And back ignition. We've heard the call out ignition. We're good power. Engine's in closed loop. This is a 44 second burn, as I said. Right now, we're running about 7.4 kilometers per second. This burn will increase the velocity of stage two carrying Telstar 18V to about 9.3 kilometers per second, transferring it to geostationary transfer orbit. We're now throttling down to limit G's on the spacecraft. Back shut down. By ice chunk. We've heard the call out for shutdown. Waiting for guidance to tell us how the orbit looks. Now, I've not heard the guidance engineer call out, but looking at data, the trajectory looks good. Nominal orbital. So surface. second stage has delivered Telstar 18V to a good orbit. We're in geostationary transfer orbit. Now the next item on the primary mission agenda is deployment of the spacecraft itself that's about five minutes from now. Now we're gonna to continue to show you live views of the second stage, and I think we've got a view of the first stage on the drone ship out in the Atlantic Ocean. There it is on the left of your screen, the first stage on drone ship. Of course, I still love you. So we're gonna pause live commentary for the moment. We'll be back to show the release of Telstar 18V in geostationary transfer orbit, coming back at about T plus 31 minutes and 30 seconds, or about three minutes from now. I realized that's something we need to talk about. Uh, that shot there of the of the booster reminded me that they do have what's known uh, as the Octo Grabber. This is a little robot that's parked on the deck of the football field sized drone ship that the rocket is currently sitting on in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, now this, it basically, there's a, a garage door. We talk about garage doors a lot in tonight's stream that opens up. It's fireproof by the way, uh, because they had one kind of get a little toasty one time when a rocket had a little bit of remaining fuel and lit the deck on fire and bye bye Octagrabber one. Uh, but the doors uh, are fireproof, blast proof, and then they open them up and they take this little Octagrabber out. It goes out underneath the, the Falcon 9 and grabs onto those same places where the uh, the hold downs that they have at the, at the launch pad. So as the rocket's uh, igniting its engines, 
Uh, it you know it only it holds onto it for almost two seconds before it lets go and commits to launch to make sure all systems are nominal. Well, the, the little octo grabber, this little robot, goes underneath there, grabs onto the, <coughs> to those launch clamps, and pulls it down, and basically just it adds weight uh, to the vehicle, which then helps it. And you know, especially like today, it's a really it could be really rough sea. Um, that's what keeps that thing now from tipping over. Because if you saw SpaceX put out a video. Um, uh, I think earlier this year, maybe late last year, called How Not to Land an Orbit Orbit Class Booster. Um, and it showed that you got to see that. I think it was JC, JC set or JSAT or something, 14 or something, some number. And it got really tippy. Uh, it kind of like bent its legs and it was just dancing across the deck. Uh, I think that's what scared them into being like, all right, we got to get something that can secure, you know, these $30 million boosters that we've recovered. We got to do everything we can to make sure it can make it back into port and we can reuse them. Um, so that's the Octograbber. Welcome, Octograbber. Hopefully we see, we're starting to see tons of images every time they come in from port. Um, rocket photographers, like my friends. <laughs> hey, guys. Hey, like John Kraus and Trevor and all you guys out there, Brady and stuff. Hey. Um, they uh, end up taking pictures of rockets when they land and you see them coming into port with a little Octograbber grabbing onto things. So, Yeah. Um, but yeah, so Plastic Pinocchio, back to your answer, the rocket has a very, there is a strict thermal limit at, at what point um, it can survive re-entry. And based on how steep of a re-entry that is compared to like a long gliding re-entry of say the space shuttle, which is even, all that's going a lot faster, re-enters for a long time, bleeds off a lot of thermal energy. We talk about that quite a bit in a video that I did probably two or three months ago called, Will the Falcon 9 be refurbishable or reusable? Um, and it talks about the differences and people were like, well, you didn't talk about the second stage. I'm like, that's not the point. People were doubting if the first stage of the Falcon 9 would actually be reusable um, because they're like, well, yeah, they can land them and recover them. I don't know why they're stereotypical. Hang on. The final event coming up, spacecraft deployment. It just passed 32 seconds, 32 minutes into flight. Nice views from the second stage as we're on the daylight side of the Earth, passing over Africa, and you can see the altitude quickly increasing following that second burn of the upper stage engine. So now we're gonna wait for the camera to switch forward and look for Telstar spacecraft separation. Great, we lost ground, ground tracking. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Successful. That's all that matters. Craft separation confirmed. SpaceX's job is done. Mission complete. Mission success. And they get these feeds from ground tracking stations. And we've got nice views of the Telstar 18V separating. A great Sorry. launch and deployment. And that's going to bring an end to our webcast. First stage liftoff. We had to wait about 77 minutes for the weather but went right at T0 at the time that we replanned to. First stage landed successfully on the drone ship out in the Atlantic Ocean. Second stage performed two great burns, putting the Telstar satellite and the second stage in the desired geostationary transfer orbit. And then as you just saw a moment ago, Telstar 18V deployed, pushed gently away from the second stage by some small springs on its way into its operational mission, raising itself up to the final orbit. With that, we'd like to thank our Telesat customer, SSL, the Air Force's 45th Space Wing for range support, and our licensing agency, the Federal Aviation Administration. We invite you to follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course on our webpage at SpaceX.com. I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening for SpaceX's 60th completed Falcon 9 mission. Sweet, guys. Yay! Yay! It happened! That's great. That makes me happy. I, I'm really happy that that was fully successful. Um, we do need to talk about just a few more. A reminder, one more time, congrats again to James and Christopher. I will be contacting you guys about how to uh, get you your your Patreon stuff. But last last reminder, if you guys want you know shirts like this, or nerdy shirts like this, or hats, or pictures like Falcon Heavy on your wall or me on a little toy space shuttle, or hoodies, or mugs, or whatever, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Um, it's the like nerdiest place on the internet, I think. 
So head over there. And again, if you want a chance to win other cool stuff uh, on Patreon, patreon.com slash everydayastronaut and support what I do here, everydayastronaut.com. Wait, patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. Um, and a huge, again, guys, sincerely thank you to my Patreon supporters and especially those in the Discord channel. Uh, yeah, you guys are my family now. So, And you're teaching me so much that I didn't know I needed to know. Uh, so yeah, so thank you. I'm going to finish up here with Renau. Uh, with your recent visits to both SpaceX and NASA, I'm even more excited than I was previously for crewed missions. Was there anything you weren't quite expecting to see? That's a really good question. Um, to be honest, I had... <coughs> excuse me. Um, I've been out to... Um, oh, I was floored that I actually got to go on the floor of Mission Control at Johnson Space Center. NASA's Mission Control Center. Like, the Mission Control. They let me, uh, Boeing's and, and uh, Bob Dempsey, who is a flight controller or flight director, um, let me <laughs> go on the floor and he had my picture up on the big screen. I about, I literally almost cried. Um, yeah, that was, that was something I did not expect to see. So big thank you to Bob and, and for Boeing and NASA for letting me do that. That was amazing. Um, but as far as I had just gone out to SpaceX in like March or April, um, so not much really looked that different there. Um, and I was with a press tour for that too, guys. And so there was a lot of other, we were very confined to a small room, another room, another room, and then like the factory floor, which I've seen a lot of times. Um, so there wasn't too much new that I wasn't expecting to see there. Um, at least not that I know. I really am curious if they're actually like manufacturing Raptor on the floor and it just looks so similar to Merlin that I have no idea. I would not be surprised. Um, it, because it's, I think it's like almost the same size and everything. So <laughs> I might have seen Raptor engines and I have no idea because it's all just, it looks so similar. So who knows? Um, so yeah, so there we go. And Cardinal Slinky, uh, thank you. I'm glad your band loves that I do. Keep rocking. Thank you. I'll try. Uh, I almost thought your logo was No Step on Snack. Uh, but hi, and thank you. And Julian, uh, and remember the next satellite that SpaceX is going to launch is SAOCOM, uh, an Argentinian satellite that is awesome, and you'll see it from my channel. That's great. Congrats, uh, Argentina. That's going to be an exciting launch. I'll be here to cover it, hopefully. I do have potentially, the month of October might be an insane month of traveling. I can't even tell you about it yet, because it's it might be nuts. Uh, in which case, I'll try my hardest to still stream when I can. Uh, I'm trying really hard to cover, like, every launch when I can. Um, so, yeah. So, we'll, we'll we'll figure it out. But I'll, I think I'll for sure be here for COCOM. Um Yeah. I think that's going to do it for me, guys. Uh, I think it's time for me to go to bed. I've got to get up early. Uh, my Discord channel is still just full of corn and, like, rockets that are made out of corn. Which, why are there so many pictures... Of rocket corn. When did... What? Uh, yeah. Thanks, Discord, for finding all of the pictures on the internet of rocket corn. I'm very impressed. <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, so if you want to see pictures of all of the rocket corn on the entire internet, uh, head on over to our Discord channel, our exclusive Discord channel, patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. I'm done here. Except for Lee Legion. Hi, Tim. This is Jill from the West Coast. I thought the GTO would have an inclination of zero degrees, but it doesn't seem to on the map they provided. Why? Great question, Jill. Um, so here's the deal with GTO launches. They have to launch. Florida is above the equator. So it has to launch um, on an inclination no matter what. They can't take it straight into an equatorial orbit. So it can't orbit around the equator from Florida right away. That's actually one of the reasons there's that coast phase. And notice that it lit its engine right down here off the coast of Africa. Well, look at what else is right off the coast of Africa. That is the equator. So what they do at that point is not only do they speed up to get the orbit really, really, really high. If they did, if they just followed the prograde trajectory in the same direction they were going, they'd end up with a really elliptical orbit out on that same inclination. But what they do is they also dogleg it so it matches with the equator. So they do this burn the second stage uh second burn uh ends up being along the equator so or near the equator because some of these i don't quite get how geostationary orbits work they can be a little bit willy wonka i don't quite know just a little bit but yeah they that's why they do it at the equator so they can get along that equatorial um 
inclination. So that that explains that. Yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Um, I might have to like demonstrate that in Kerbal sometime or something. Um, I know a lot of people have been asking me to play Kerbal. I've been really busy. It's not a big priority for me now. Um, I might need to make a second Kerbal program or something just so if I want to have fun, I don't have to. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. But that's that's gonna be it. Um, they do the inclination change at the other end of the orbit, says Tom JLB. Um, that's true, Tom JLB. You're right because it's it's cheaper to do your inclination change at Apogee. Um, but I think there's still a reason why they do it there probably so the apogee is on the uh descending and ascending node so let me explain that you're right you're absolutely right so what they do is they still burn and they keep it elliptical it's still at this kind of high inclination like this so it's still at a weird angle the orbit is but they do it here so that um when they're at their highest point out at the geostationary point you can't even see my other hand there we go like way out here uh the inclination node so where where the two planes intersect of the equator and where the you know where the orbit goes the highest point is still exactly at the ascending node and then they can just do a plane change up there um it doesn't cost very much delta v to do an inclination change at a high altitude but it does cost a lot to do it at the equator so i think you're right i think you're absolutely right so yeah uh that wasn't actually my question i was saying that it is actually not zero degree inclination after the second stage oh I thought the geode would have an inclination of zero degrees, but it doesn't seem on the map for Friday. Yeah, I'm not sure. I hope that... There we go. People are confirming you're right. Um, uh, how? Ask him to show how far off that globe 180 miles is. Uh, so 180 miles, 250 miles, or uh, 250 kilometers would be like literally... Uh, like the International Space Station is like here. Like just skimming. It's so crazy when you actually see the actual altitude. I did a video one time um, about the uh, what would it look like to see an eclipse, uh, the, a solar eclipse from orbit, basically, and um, from space is what it was called. I, it was last year, right after the eclipse, I, I put it out, and uh, I show you the, the actual pixel-to-pixel -pixel ratio of how high orbits are all the way out to you know lunar orbit and things. It's crazy. Uh, it's really close to the surface. The International Space Station is just skimming above the atmosphere. And because the atmosphere is still a little bit, there's a very trace amount of atmosphere, they do constantly have to reboost it. So, yeah. All right. I have to get going, guys. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I got to go to bed. I'm going to grow delirious here soon. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, join me next launch. Again, check out those pre-launch previews. If you have questions about upcoming launches, show your friends that. If they're like, oh, what time is this? Just pre-launch preview. That's all you need. Um, and hopefully you guys uh, have a great night and a great week. Uh, it's going to be Monday. It is Monday for me now. Whoa. All right. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Bye, everyone.